Okay, the message of the book. Point number one, the burden prophet talks to God. Now, I want to tell you something tonight. If you have a burden, before you talk to other people and get them all upset, before you, you know, lay it on somebody else, the burden prophet talked to God. The first place he went when he had a big problem, when he didn't understand what was going on, when he didn't like what was going on, when he thought what was going on was wrong, he talks to God. Point number one, the burden prophet talks to God. Number two, if you want to open it up into the next section, the bended prophet, and that speaks of uh, bended on his knees, the bended prophet speaks to God. Uh, the bended prophet um, speaks to God and, uh, and then quietly waits. This is a time of waiting. He patiently waits. And then point three, the blessed prophet praises God. The blessed prophet praises God. Uh, the burdened prophet talks to God, and uh, the first problem he has is, why does God allow evil to continue? And what's interesting is Habakkuk isn't like any of the other prophets. Jonah and Nahum spoke to Assyria. Hosea spoke to Israel. Micah speaks to his own people, Judah. But Habakkuk speaks to God. He's, he's rare among the prophets. His book is just a discourse with God. Habakkuk, however, is much like Job. In Job 19.7, Job said, If I cry aloud concerning wrong, I'm not heard. If I cry aloud, there's no justice. That's exactly where Habakkuk is as he's writing this book. Asaph, uh, in Psalm 73, writes a book, I mean, a whole, a whole psalm about why do the wicked prosper and why are the righteous downtrodden. And, and the 73rd Psalm is a great psalm when you see uh, ungodly people riding around in their limousines up through their gated, you know, colonnaded house up on top of the hill. And you go, how come? The 73rd Psalm in Asaph is a complete description of God's perspective on, on the rich people that know him not. And finally, Habakkuk is much like Jeremiah. In chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, Jeremiah gives his cry to God and says, I don't understand. Next point there is that Habakkuk asks seven questions. Seven questions. The first one is kind of like, are you there? I mean, have you ever done that? You ever been going through a problem in the hospital? Maybe you're at an accident scene. Maybe you're near a dying loved one. You go, are you there, God? I mean, you know, what's wrong? Listen to what he says in, in Habakkuk 1-2. And you can follow along in your Bibles because these seven questions, if you've never marked these things in your Bible, they're really neat to have because we ask these questions, and, and next time someone's in a, a tragic moment and they say, where's your God? You say, you know, there's a whole book written about that. Habakkuk 1, 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry to you violence and you will not save? He's saying, help, you know, police, murder. You know, that's what he's just screaming out. And no answer. Second question, are you aware? Look at verse 3. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife. Contention arises. Do you know what's going on, God? I mean, do you know? Are you listening? Are you watching? Third question. Are you God? Starting to have his doubts. Verse 12, Habakkuk 1.12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O rock. You have marked them for correction. He, he's just rethinking everything he always knew. He says, don't you mark out the bad guys and do something to them? Are you God? Now look at verse 13, the first part. He's saying, are you omniscient? Do you really know everything that's going on? I always was taught you did. And this 13th verse starts out by saying, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You can't look on wickedness. Why do you look on those Babylonians? Those bad guys. Why? Uh, don't you know? I thought you knew everything. Don't you know how they treat their enemies and how they treat you and how they're treating us? I mean, you could say, don't you know how my fellow workers are telling lies about me? Don't you know how my neighbor is causing problems? Don't you know? Don't you know? You know, we start getting, you know, all befuddled. Don't you know? God says, I know. Look at the last part of verse 13. You're a, I'll start in the middle. You're of pure eyes and to behold evil. You can't look on wickedness. Why do you hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? You know what he's saying? Are you holy? Do you really always make right decisions? I mean, for that baby to die, for them to, that Christian to suffer so long, you know, it, 
the questions we all have, are you holy? Do you really do everything right? Habakkuk 1.14, are you sovereign? He asked. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? What he's saying is, how come everything's falling apart? I mean, they're just like fish going their own way. Those Babylonians seemingly are unleashed. They're just doing their own thing. I thought you were sovereign. I thought you totally controlled things. Last question, verse 17. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? What he's saying is, don't you have the power to stop them? I mean, haven't you ever asked that? People asked that all the way through from 1939 on with Hitler. Doesn't God have the power to stop that? Can he keep burning people up like that? It, and, you know, they pretty soon they got to the end. They just couldn't imagine God being omnipotent. That time is going to come back soon in our world if it isn't in yours right now. And basically, he asks these seven questions, and God answers to all seven, yes. Yes. Yes, I am there. And yes, I am aware. And yes, I am God. And yes, I am an omniscient. I know everything. I'm holy. I'm totally in control. And I have all power.